Welcome to Tom Girl, where we talk all things sports, entertainment, fashion, and adventure. On this episode, we're talking to a true voiceover rock star. You've heard her voice on The View, the Oscars on the Red Carpet Show, Windy City Live, and numerous other places. Please welcome to the show the incredible Virginia Hamilton. Woo! Hello, hello, hello. We got a favorite part of the day to get to sit with you. Yeah, I'm so happy just because you know how much I love you and I've been wanting to talk to you forever. I'm like, this is not only great, I get to interview her, but just just see your face and see your amazing hair and your Just spirit. get to hang out. Yep, the hair. There's always something going on. I know. I love it. It's different every time. It's great. You gotta keep yourself entertained. Do you do it yourself? Yeah. Yeah. You just put, so easy now, you just put yeah. those like dye shampoos in. You have to get it bleached. So I just have my hairdresser bleach it and then you know whatever I'm feeling I put in how long does the color stay it actually stays a lot longer than you think it also helps that my hair is really damaged you know from many 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 years of dyeing it and bleaching it and yeah. my kids are always jealous because my hair can pretty much stand straight up as soon as I dry it like I don't really need stuff in it and they get so mad they're like why can't my hair do that and I'm like because your hair is healthy yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> so, well, it looks hair. healthy and beautiful. All right. Well, I want to pick your brain now that I got you here for, you know, a few minutes or hopefully longer than a few minutes, but now that I got you here sitting down, let's, um, do let's talk about your amazing voiceover career and let's start from people. I know they probably have heard your voice and haven't seen your face or do they don't know who it is they've been listening to. So let's talk about some of the jobs that you're currently working on now, such as The View. The View, my favorite. The View is my favorite. Um, so I do, uh, I, I do actually the for The View. I do the in-show narration, which is the thing where you introduce the show. So like, park it and pay attention, and whatever's going to happen on The View. So you get to talk about lots of, you know, usually it's it's been politics a lot for the last like six years. Um, God, I've been doing the show now eight ish eight-ish or something. Um, but I also do the promos for it as well, because that used to be two different jobs. Before me, um, they've had different, they've had men and women do the promos, but before me, they'd had a guy do the in-show narration. Can you believe that? No, for yeah. almost, you know, for like 15 years. It was crazy. So I was the first time they actually moved on to, it was like treating it like there was another woman at the table, yeah. which <clears throat> That was a long time coming as far as I'm concerned and glad to be the first, but I shouldn't have been, it should have been, should have happened a long time ago, but yeah, but I do love that show. It's always so controversial and I work with, it's an amazing team. So, you know, do you remember like what you felt like when they, when you found out your agent said you got that job? I totally do. Cause I was in Vegas at the time. Um, I was in Vegas at a convention. So I was in Vegas doing, um, I do promos for uh, TV stations. So all the news stations across the country. So I have a, a, a ton, a ton of those things. Um, so I was at their, um, I don't know if you've ever been to that. It's called Station Summit for Promax. I haven't so been, but I know. It's yeah. specifically yeah. for sta the TV sta news stations across the country. So I was at that convention meeting people. Um, and my agent was actually there. <clears throat> at the, um, there at the place when we, when he called me, I remember I just happened to be sitting on my bed, like, as I was recording some stuff and he called and he told me, and I remember jumping up and down on my bed. Awesome. It's very like, you know, when you're in a business for a long time, you tend to start, you get a little jaded in terms of, you don't take the wins as it, they're not as, you don't let them be as exciting as, cause you know, it's a job and, and I love my job, but sometimes you forget how exciting it is to get like that, those, those breaks or, you know, just a really cool job. And that was one of those that I truly remember just, I was so excited. I fought really hard to get that audition and, you know, really advocated for myself and yeah. Like, so I was so, I was so proud of that one because now you, can I ask, how did you yeah. fight for yourself and, and get yourself so you could get that chance? Well, when I, let's see, I do, I used to, 
do, I still do sometimes, but it was back when we had a lot more soaps. I worked for ABC daytime. So I would do, God, that would be General Hospital and, you know, a bunch of those. So I would do, okay, I would occasionally go in and do the voiceover because it was, again, a, a, mainly a guy. But when they would have a girl, I would come in. And that was back in the day when you actually went into the studio. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> then they started looking for, um, they wanted to, it was the promo side that came up first. And they wanted to, I think at that time, did they have a guy or a girl? That that was, I think they'd had, they'd had a woman and then it went to a man. They were doing auditions again, but they didn't want to hear anybody that was already on ABC. Mm -hmm. So I originally didn't, I found out about it because we all talk and um, I called my agent about it. And I was just like, and he was like, yeah, they specifically said they didn't want to, you know, and <clears throat> I happened to be going to meet with my producer that day for the out to lunch with my producer from the ABC daytime. And I, I was like, so you guys are doing auditions for the view. And I totally pitched myself. Wow. And I was like, you actually need like a younger woman on that show because you already have your, you know, their main audiences tend to be slightly older women. And I was like, what you really need to do is pick up younger women. And I'm the one that can do that because I can bridge the gap between older and younger. You know, it's not, and you know, it's like you also, it's like that you can pull in some guys too, but I mean, women are their, their bread and butter. So um, I fought and got the audition and then I booked it. That um, is so incredibly amazing that you did yeah. that, you know, because there's a yeah. lot of conversations we have like, oh, am I overstepping? Should I not do it? Like the fact that you went, Look, went we for all, that is amazing. We've all, um, I mean, the reality is you've had to have something in your past where you didn't do that to learn the lesson to make yourself do it. And I've had. I mean, we've all had those. If you've been doing, I mean, unless you're brilliant when you come, like when you're younger and have so much confidence and it hasn't been beaten out of you yet, you know, <laughs> we've all hit that where yep. you don't, you have, you miss that one time and you're like, I was perfect for that. And if I'd only fought, like I could have changed their mind or, and I've had specific ones where I've lost out on a job, like more when I used to be on camera acting and doing stage acting where you know, later on, the producer, the director had said later on, like, why didn't I see you for that? Like, you're perfect for this. And you're like, I knew I was and I should have fought for it. Yeah. So, yeah. You learn. And yeah. hopefully you learn the lesson and apply it. So that was one of those times. So that was also why it was such a big win. When yeah, definitely. Had, yeah. That's great. So it's a good lesson. to It's a good thing to remember, too, just to celebrate your wins. Yeah. Well, and especially in VO, because there's a lot of no's, you know, there's so many jobs you audition for that you're not, you don't get. I mean, let's be honest, really, you, when you audition, you just have to, you have to audition, let it go and be done with it. Like now, I mean, for the most part, I don't think about them again. You do it, send it in, you're done, you walk away. Mm -hmm. I used to like follow up a little bit more, like, so whatever happened with that one, you know, I used to do that. And now I'm like, you have to consider auditioning your job. Yeah. So you do your job. And when you book a big job like The View, then I consider it back pay for all the auditions that I did for that job when I wasn't. Yeah, what would you think about the ranges now from the amount of auditions that you do to what you book? Um, I have a higher ratio, but I'm also more selective. Um. I'm incredibly lucky to be in that position, but I pass on a lot of stuff purely because there's not enough time in a day. Yeah. Like, and you know, at some point you also go, I don't need every job. Yeah. I don't, you know, and that was a big one to get to, you know, and took a long time to get that. Yeah. You know, being in this career, it's like you fight for, and you'll take, you know, at the beginning you take everything and you're doing tiny jobs for tiny bits of money and you are cobbling together your career and you do a crap load of jobs that are not great pay. And then you get to a point where you're like, it's not really worth the time to do that one. Like it's not even, sometimes it's not even worth the audition. It also depends on what people are asking for an audition. 
Because you know, sometimes it's like you're doing a 30 second thing for an audition. And then there are other times where people really want, like they want multiple, you're auditioning for like, I get it for when you're auditioning for a network. They want to see what your range is. So they want to see the scope. Mm -hmm. But, and those are great to do, but they're also exhaust. I mean, that's, it's a long time to work on that kind of audition. So if it's not a really good one and it's going to take a long time, or unless I'm really excited about it, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, especially okay. with the, your schedule, because talk about your schedule with a view. You're starting early. Yeah, I start. I start at my phone goes live at five thirty. Now there are have been only a handful of times that they call that I really truly record before six thirty, but my phone is live at five thirty. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I am just like every other person that wants to get every ounce of sleep possible. So I've gotten it down pretty good where I can. I mean, I have literally answered the phone from, from a dead sleep because <laughs> they needed something earlier than we were ready to schedule to go. And I'm like, morning. Yep. Hey, I mean, I can go from zero to a hundred in no time. So you wake up, your voice can just be ready. You you don't have a choice. I mean, there are times, there are definitely times, like, and I have a couple things. I say absolutely filthy things in the morning because it's what gets me to that. Because the view is so high energy. It's not like you're doing a low key narration. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the view is so high energy, I have a filthy mouth in the morning just to get me in the zone of launching into, into that. Yeah, and that's one thing I love. He'll, he'll suffer through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love your filthy mouth. One thing I I love most about you, <laughs> it is I do. Yeah, I do love it, and it's just part of who I am. I know so that's I, kind of your style is also doing the lead-ins. Can you explain to people what that means? How you set yourself up to be ready to read like that? So every because especially if you're doing this as a career, you're gonna have such different stuff all day. Like I'll go from. The view, which is really high energy, and it's and it tends to be like a a, a a tamer version of my morning ridiculous lead in for the view would be like, all right, bitches, because it's like I that one for me connects really fast to a girlfriend, so it puts me in a mindset of um, how I want to go after connecting with that particular audience Mm -hmm. because you're always trying to figure out like who you're it is very specific of who you're talking to and what point of view you're carrying across and the view has different colors you know depends if you're talking political but at the same time for that I need to be so high energy that I need something like that that that's the tame version it usually has a lot of f-bombs in it (laughs) and whatever to get me into that but then you know like right after that uh, like lifetime, I do their Christmas campaign. So then that's really cheery. So it's, it's really heartwarming and, you know, it's a wonderful lifetime. It's just such a warm feeling. So I tend to just, every job has usually something different, you know, not every job has like the perfect lead in, but mine tend to be just tailored to shifting me into that. Cause I like, I'm sure you've noticed that when you go back to back, your first take will be a little muddy. And and I say muddy in terms of if I was going from the view into lifetime, it would probably be too energetic. Even when I do a lead in of like, you know, um, oh my God, thanks for coming. Like, I'm so glad you guys came over. Like you just changed the attitude and the feel, but you still have to work through, you have to get past where you just were. It's like, it's like getting it all out. It's like changing colors And you need the other color to finish running, bleeding out Mm -hmm. before you're solidly in the next color. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how I look at it. So I use lead-ins to help me. So at the very beginning of the spot, I'm already in there and I'm not warming up to where I need to be, Mm -hmm. which is a lot a mistake a lot of people make, that they use the first sentence or the first what chunk. And then that's why a lot of people will be like, at the end of the take, they're like, I love where you're at now. Start again. 
especially in, in the genre of promo where you don't have much time. You don't have a lot of copy. It's not like you're reading a narration and you can get, you're going, you're either through. got, you've got 30 seconds. If you're lucky, most of them are 15. And then of course there's the fives, which is usually, you know, so you have to be in the zone. You have to find the zone of your spot, your copy. Yeah. Well, another one of your huge gigs is Live Announce, being on the red carpet for the Oscars, like the biggest event in uh, Hollywood. So love tell it. me about that. That, um, that is, yeah, yeah, like of the, of my live gigs, it's one of my favorite because I do. There's a couple that I do that I just, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to be being out there on the red carpet with the Oscars. It's just, it's insane. It is insane. It's always been insane. Um, that one, um, that one came off of, I was doing the, um, primetime creative arts Emmys. So not the regular, the normal Emmys that everybody sees at that time I was doing the creative arts Emmys. So it'll be like, it's all the behind the scenes things. So it's your makeup artists, your, your directors and it's all of them. So, and I love doing it, but coming off of that, <clears throat> somehow I ended up doing the, like the AMAs for the first one. I did a little bit of a live announce for that and it rolled into doing the, on the red carpet. And, but that was the first time it was ever live. I mean, live, live, live. Like when we say live, Sometimes it's like, it's, you know, you have smaller audience or there's a delay or it's, it's live and they tape it the night before and then they play it back. Mm -hmm. That was the first time that you are, you're up shit's Creek. If your shit comes out of your mouth. I mean, and I was terrified. I, I remember like, I remember the first year I did it, I had to say Gabourey Sidibe. And I can effortlessly say her name because I practice everybody's name for like a month, you know, going into that because you're terrible. You have no idea. It's all live. So you don't know who's going to show up when you cut your riffing, which is terrifying to do. And because I have such a sailor's mouth, I was like, I'll get, I'm going to get, I don't know how I'm not going to get fired <laughs> on my, on my in the first hour. And it was a long, it's a long day. Yeah. Um, you're in place hours before the red carpet opens. And then when the red carpet opens, the red carpet goes for hours before the show starts. That's a long time also to not have to, to not be able to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. by the way. <laughs> Just saying, you know, when, when we're in a job that you're like, it's all about being lubricated and hydrated. And it's like, nope. Yeah. It's like, you're not touching any water. You're like doing sips because you're like, I cannot, cannot, cannot have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Well, plus you're talking, so you want your, your mouth moisturized and yeah. <clears throat> Living on lozenges. Um, but yeah, that, so that job was, but it was, it, I, it's the thing that makes me miss theater. I haven't done theater in years, but that's part of my background coming at this is with theater. So it was the, it was the first job that really felt like that, like being back such a collaboration with everybody. You have so many people talking in your ear. That's the other thing that people forget or don't think about is that when I'm doing that, I have directors and producers and because you have a headset and I'm watching a screen to see what they're showing. And then I've also got other screens to see back, like, you know, where other cameras are, but I'm responding to what everybody's seeing. Like we're all seeing it at the same time. So all of a sudden, and I've got to say, you know, pleasant things. I mean, it's easy to say because, you know, you're a fan anyway. It's easy when you're a fan because you yeah. just, get to, you know, just be all excited yeah. when you see. I remember seeing George Clooney. That was the year George, Ooh. the first year was the year George Clooney got out like um, a few blocks. Instead of getting to the red carpet, he got, it was, there's a backlog of traffic. So he gets out blocks away like by chain link fences, you know, cause people are lined up for like a mile down Hollywood Boulevard. So he just got out and walked, but our cameras were there and we had no idea. I mean, had no idea. And then it, all of a sudden he pops on and I'm like, Hey George, you know, and he's, I mean, he's not talking back to, but it was just like, you're just reacting to stuff. And it was actually one of those moments where it was so gold for them, you know, just because it's so interactive. 
The, yeah. It's because the whole thing is just being live. And I did big lesson I learned on that doing that show um, for so many years is <clears throat> the perfectionist thing that we a lot of us have. Yeah. It would kill me. I was so like that first year, I don't think I stumbled at all. Like, you know, and getting through a show, a live show for hours, because we'd also be on air for hours, is shocking. I mean, let's be honest, even having a normal conversation, you stop that you stumble. Like yeah. you, you can't think of a word or which, you know, that happens a lot. Um, and you do like I would do exhaustive research before. I'm I'm not kidding that I would write. Um, I would look up every adjective you could use for somebody looking good. Glitz, glamour, um, <clears throat> charming, you know, debonair. Like I would create it because I hate repeating myself. Mm. So, and I didn't, and you weren't doing a three to four hour broadcast. How, how on earth you don't want beautiful. Who's going to, nobody wants to hear beautiful 400 yeah. times. She looks amazing. Everybody does that constant it's constant everybody looks amazing so um i would prep by i mean going over i had picture you know you go over everybody's names you go over all these you know words that you can so that it's easier when you're in the moment to act naturally and to respond but eventually you are going to stumble over yourself you're going to make a mistake you are absolutely going to do it and the first year i did it i was so oh god it it ruined the rest of it. And, and I'm there all day because we also do the post show after. So it was a really hard thing to come back. For. And all it was, was I'm sure I think I'm almost positive. It was like glitz and glamour. And I stumbled over the words and I picked it back up and, you know, kept going. So it's not a big deal, but I was so bummed about it. And then when I, I would go back and watch the show to kind of just see how everything came off, it ended up being one of my favorite moments of the show oh. because it showed like, what you love about those things are the live nature of it. Like you, those are the moments you love. And when you're on camera, you have more of an excuse. It's easy. You're covering yourself and people are watching you and it's easier to cover yourself on stumbles. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're just the voiceover, you don't have, you have nothing to fall back on. You don't get to like kind of giggle it off and laugh. You've got nothing. So when you mess up, it's a mess up. But it still had that, it made it really, you get too produced and you get too good sounding that you don't sound live anymore. Yeah. And that takes away from it. Like you want to you want to have that feeling that you're there because you are. So you don't want to sound too polished, but it ended up being one of my favorite moments. So now it made, it was such a great lesson because it took off so much stress. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's just because as a listener, you know, an, an audience, we don't really, you don't really get hung up if somebody stumbles or if they're right. like, you know, but it's, it's right. that personal pressure you're putting on yourself. It gets you. Yeah. Perfection. You yeah. talked a little bit about your background. What <laughs> is your background? How did you, what were you doing early on and how did you find your way into this world? I went to college for theater. Well, I think I started actually in public relations, you know, did that thing where you thought you had to major in something realistic, you know? Um, and by my, I think it was my end of my sophomore year, must have been end of my sophomore year. I'd already cleared a theater major on an in dance minor. And, you know, you had to get real about your major. And I think, and at that point I was at public relations and <clears throat> I went, I had, there was a lecture, you know, you're getting ready to sign up for your ne um, next semester's classes. And a guy from the core, he was the PR guy from Coors Beer Company. And, you know, I'm in college. I'm like, ah, that's a great job. I mean, if I'm going to do anything, PR for Coors, that sounds yeah. great, you know? And I remember him taking, turning over the blackboard and he had a list of like 20 things he does in a day. And he flipped it over and I looked at that list and I was like, I don't want to do one of those things, let alone all of those things every day. And then I fell asleep during his lecture. Oh. I'm so sorry for whoever that was. And I changed my major the next day. I was like, I can't, I can't do, I can't do it. So <clears throat> I majored in theater. And then after college, I went to Chicago and I had that thing. I was on the East coast and it was like, 
you, you do that. Is it New York or is it LA? And then I met somebody that was in Chicago and I was like, Oh, Chicago. It seemed like the, the middle ground, mm-hmm. like New York always felt like that place. Everybody goes to do theater, but they're waiting tables for years before they get to do a show. And LA was purely on camera and I was a theater major, you know? Mm-hmm. So I went to Chicago cause you could work while you were you could do shows while you were actually, you know, waiting tables. And Chicago was great. And I started a theater company with a group of people, like the first year I was there. So I did Chicago for like five years and I loved it and did everything. Cause in Chicago that, you know, they have TV shows, they have tons of industrial stuff you can do. So it's great for a working actor because you can be on stage. You, there's just, it's a, it's an amazing playground to learn your craft. And then, you know, you get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm going to try LA came out here. And I was doing voiceovers on the side as we all do. It's like doing commercials. So, you know, when you're doing all your other jobs, commercials are just, they pay the bills. It's, you know, they become better. I think as we've all over the years, but really the only reason you want to do a commercial is to get paid. Like nobody's like, you know, I want my whole career to be based on commercials. So voiceovers was like that too. I had done a musical and somebody had come there like, oh, you should look into doing voiceovers. So I I got into it right before I left Chicago. And when I, so when I was out here, I was just kind of doing all of that. You know, you're, I was doing on camera, a lot of on camera when I first got out here, voiceover on the side. And the moment my husband and I <clears throat> talked about having a kid, I played a bunch of people, pregnant people on TV done a lot of guest spots where you're pregnant. And I knew that once I was pregnant, I wasn't working. Like there was your liability on set. Nobody want nobody wants a pregnant woman on their set. There it's too, the liability of you falling, just tripping over something, you know. So I was like the moment I'm showing, I'm out for a year because I won't be able to get I won't be able to work. So I literally decided to shift I was like, well, I can do voiceovers while I'm doing that. And I focused on it. And within six months, I had shifted my career wow. to voiceover. It was it was also perfect time. You know, it's the perfect storm. I mean, this job is perfect for me. I didn't know this. I didn't really know this existed when I was in school. Like this, I would have never known. You couldn't have asked me to picture that I'd be doing this when I was in college, because I didn't know it existed. Even when I was in Chicago doing voiceovers on the side, you were, it was still like, for that most part, it was doing commercials. You know, I didn't, the promo land hadn't opened up. When I first got into promo, my um, voiceover agent at the time didn't think he was like, there, there's no point because of being a younger woman. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, that's bullshit. And there hasn't been nothing that is spurred me more than competing with men because I don't, I don't really look at it as competing with women because it's like, I'm so psyched when any of my girls get a job, like when any of my girlfriends book stuff, I'm so excited. And I don't really think of it as competing with other women. I compete with the guys because they still, even now, and it's changed tremendously over the last 10 years, but even now they have a monopoly on the work. Yeah. So, yeah. How so, did you, I know you really busted in there and like went for a lot of the jobs and how did you yeah. create, how did you grow your business? Um, <clears throat> you know, it's going after everything. And back when I first started focusing on voiceover, that was at the beginning of having a home studio. I mean, at the very, very, very early stages, the only people that were really doing it were radio people. Because they, that was already kind of there in, like if you were a DJ, which is where a lot of voiceover people come from. You either, in general, you either come from uh, a radio background, like DJing, or you come from theater. In general, that's a very generalized, but that is a very common through line for people to come into voiceover. And um, see, this is where I go. What was the question? Uh, how right you went line. about busting down the doors and oh, kind of yeah, growing yeah. your business. Um, so it was putting together 
Um, I was working with a vocal co- coach at that time. And I think she had somebody else that had done it, like just put together a rudimentary, you know, setup. So I did that. And then I went after agents all across the country. Because when you're starting out, the key is you just need jobs. You need to do it. It's, I mean, there's no better other than like when anybody asks, I'm always, I always talk about like the best thing you can do is take workshops with other people because you want to, A, I believe in having that competitive nature and <clears throat> we all steal stuff from each other. Like when I'm in, is in so I love, I love auditioning in a room with other people. I love to see what they do. I love the creativity that comes out and you're like, ah, that was great. I'm going to take, like, I should uh, want to use that, but I want to twist it this way. It's more collaboration. So working in that land, you know, it was going after everything. After you do like workshops or you do whatever your, whatever your background is, whether it's theater, I still think workshops are, it's also a great way to meet casting directors, but then it is just doing it. Like if somebody wasn't booking, I would be like, you need to produce your own spots. Like that's what you should be doing every day because you get better at this with confidence. Your confidence comes from doing the job. So even if nobody else is hearing it and you're just putting it together for your own ears and then comparing it to what what other people do, which is so easy because everything's online and you can listen to everybody's demo. Like the treasure trove that we have now because of technology is insane. It's insane. Like back when we were, you know, when it was first starting out like this, you didn't, it wasn't as easy to do. But that was my key was that I went across the country. I picked every area, went after agents. And at some, one point, I mean, I had probably like 10 or 15 agents mm-hmm. in tiny, because you pick them up in small areas because you'll get local work. Because yeah. that's, those are the, those are great. And local, ju- like everybody moves up. Those producers end up going somewhere. If you, you know, ideally you do a good job, people take you with them or you meet them up again some years down the road. Mm -hmm. But it really was that. It was just doing a lot of local stuff in different areas while you're still auditioning for the bigger stuff. But it's like getting, booking the big jobs is like winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. It, It just is. And until, and confidence is so like, there's technique. There's absolutely technique. Everybody thinks they can walk in and do this job. And I'm not saying it's not brain surgery at all, but there are, there is technique and there are challenges to actually doing the job, not just booking it. But once you get those down, it's the confidence of what you're doing, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and for me, having a theater background is huge. Like that's made it for my, for, for my career. Cause I have such a, um, it helps me with all the different directions that you want to go. Cause there's so many different in within voiceover, all the niches that you can do. So finding your niche, you know, and being able to bra- branch out into others, but yeah. How does so, that all also help you with yourself? So much of this is self-directed auditions now being at home yeah. and not with the, anybody in the booth telling you what to do. So how do you process and go through that? You know, when, now, again, you know, after you've been doing it for long enough, <clears throat> you don't need some of these things. But one of the best things that I did early on when I was at home, because once the at home stuff started to really kick in and we all started having to do it, and then you'd have you'd be doing your auditions at home because back in the day, you would go into your agent's office to audition, which was great because at least you had the booth director to bounce off of that was going to direct you and guide you. and. When you're at home, that's a bitch. It's a bitch yeah. trying to separate your hats while you're working, you know, to not to try not to give yourself notes while you're actually in the middle of a take. Like it's hard to do that. I actually have a couple girlfriends that are in this business and they're all like we've all come up together and they are rock stars, but we would jump on with each other. Oh, that's awesome. And we would basically direct each other. You know, and so much of it is subjective. And that's what people also forget. It's a subjective business. You have to know enough about it to kind of get an idea of like, well, usually, you know, you get a feel for the client or whatever the product is and kind of get an idea of which direction, you know, kind of a loose 
evolution of what needs to come. And then you try to put your own stamp on it. Like that's ideally what you're doing. But, you know, sometimes finding your own voice on things is, you know, that's hard too, because we're all trying to blend and be malleable. Mm-hmm. I just think that was when I came out of college, I thought that was my best thing. I was like, oh, I'm so directable. I'm so malleable. I can do, you know, I felt like I could do, which that's great to be able to do that, but you have to offer up something first. And that's what a lot of actors forget. Like nobody wants a blank slate. You need to come in with something. And then it's great. Like I pride myself on if a producer or director wants to, I can adjust. That's, that's where the skills of theater come in to being able to adjust to direction. It's a, it's a great, you have to have that skill and it comes easier to certain people. But if you don't have something to start with, nobody what's there to work with. Mm-hmm. That was a lesson. It took me a long time, <laughs> long time to get like, yeah. What are some of the other things that you've learned over the years or that you wish you would have known sooner or just, you know, tips or advice <laughs> you have for people wanting to go into voiceover? Um, God. Um, I mean, if I was doing it, if I was doing it now, starting if I was starting out now, I would honestly work on putting together my own spots every day. Like you should be picking spots. You should, there are ways to get copy, like without hearing it from the final. It's like, it's always great to like a great thing. If you're doing it on your own and you're not in a workshop, I mean, these are things you can do outside of a workshop, but getting copy for a, a spot, even if you picked a spot that's so not your, yours, it's great to not hear it first and do your own thing. Put it together for yourself. And that doesn't mean you have to do all the music and it's not, you don't have to do that. But I'm saying do your audition, do your job, and then play it next to like next to a final finalized version. Like if you want to go into promos, they're on all day. Like mm-hmm. you, there's no excuse with technology now that you can't find and study yourself and you should be practicing it every day. So we get to practice it every day. We're practicing our craft every day because it's become our full-time job, right? Which is great, which is what you aspire to. So you kind of have to treat it like that when you're starting out. And it's harder because you don't usually have as much time, but really you have more time than you think. (laughs) Because once you're in this, you go, how on earth did I have so much time before? Like, what did I do with my time? So, you know, that's the biggest thing. It's the practice. And we all always thought you only get your practice when you go into the booth and you audition. Like, there's your practice, yeah. you know, like you're working on it at home. But but the reality is it's not that anymore. You have the whole, so we all have a whole setup. Even if you just have a microphone, interface into your computer. You're ready to go. You can be practicing it every day. What do you do to get yourself in? You know, cause you know, there's days where you're just off or you're just like, <laughs> you can't get that audition, you know, like anything that, yeah. And I think now even more kind of with the pandemic when we all got so isolated oh. even more, I mean, voiceover people are already isolated anyway, <laughs> but then it became this other heavy layer. I feel like a lot of VO artists felt. So and- how do you- how do you get I think out of it's that? with any job too, is you're going to hit plateaus where you're like, uh, you're so grateful for your work. I mean, I'm so grateful for my jobs. It doesn't mean I love doing my job every day. Like I'm so grateful for it. And I love what my career is, but yeah, there are days where you're just like, oh, and dealing with pet peeves from your clients mm. oh, and that list. Good God. Yeah. There are days where it gets a, you know, yeah. You're in, and you're also just in a shitty mood, <laughs> you know, trying to work through a shitty mood sucks. Try being in a really shitty mood in July and trying to do Christmas spots <laughs> lifetime. That's awesome. When you're on a vacation and the rest of your family is out surfing and you can see them and you're in there doing Christmas spots because it's got to get done. Um, you know, like, Honestly, I don't even know what you would, how you, like, cause that's life for everybody, mm-hmm. like sucking it up, doing the crap you don't want to do when you still have to do it. Like mm-hmm. you just don't have a choice. And again, that's where lead-ins are helpful 
because you have to shift your mindset because you can't go into, you get like, I will, if somebody recorded the shit I say before, like you're in your booth and you sound like a crazy person because sometimes you're talking to yourself. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, I'm so fucking, I'm so fucking don't want to do this today. You got to get it out because you don't want that read in your happy, warm, sitting by a cozy fire and the and it's snowing outside Mm -hmm. watching your lifetime shows, you know? Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of rant, get it out, rant, and then change and then adjust your rant. So I will full on bitch, even if it's just to myself in there, bitch, and then start to rant. Like some, there are a lot of teachers that'll use what's called a rant for, you know, working on a spot, um, which is basically like you're getting getting in touch with your vision, your personal view of things. So you're you, you are authentically yourself. So I tend to do that anyway, just to flush out where I'm at and then try to shift into talking about what I'm about to go into, just to shift the perspective, you know. Yeah, that's a great thing about puppies. Yeah. Is it that um, puppies? Think of puppies. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, if you think about rolling around with puppies in the backyard, like how the fuck do you not smile? Yeah. Like, so yeah. And I'm not kidding. I've probably, I've used that a lot. Yeah. Think of puppies. <laughs> that's where it's always good to have a studio dog, right? Like I was showing you mine, like right before, you know, there's times you just go down there, give yep. them a little <laughs> yep. kisses from the dog and get going. <laughs> You're like, oh, okay, just clean slate, clean slate. So you've worked on so much stuff. So, so many, is there anything out there that you still like that you're just dying to do? Or do you have any dream jobs you want? Um, It's so funny because I hit pockets where I don't. I'm like, God, what is, what's the next thing? You know, because a lot of times, you don't know what that is. I know that sounds weird, but some of the best one, I just didn't, you know, I was like, I love everything I'm doing. And what else? Like, you know, I'll look at other people's job and I'm like, Oh, love that. That's a great job. I don't care. Not, not that you don't care, but you're just like, Oh, it's, I don't find that missing. Like I don't find anything missing, but every once in a while, there'll be a job that comes up. Um, what was, Oh, one of them just came up and I was up for it and didn't get it. And it was the first time that in a while that I'd been kind of like, I was like, I really would have liked to have done that. Um, It was the Mark Twain um, live uh, awards that they do at the Kennedy, the Kennedy Center Honors. It was the Kennedy Center Honors. And I, you know, it's like, I wouldn't, if you'd asked me two weeks before that, I was on my radar, you know, I would have been like, no, I can't, you know, I love taking on new network stuff because it's, uh, it's so much fun because you get to do so much different stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, um, true real is one of my networks and the variety you get to do. And like, they'll come to me and we're like, okay, hey, we're going to do a song over this. So you're like, all right, we're going to do a song over this, like, or we're going to do a parody or like, those are the ones that I love the most, the things that make me kind of a little nauseous mm-hmm. and re and then kind of buck. Like you're like, I don't, and I've had that, like for some of my best job, the jobs that ended up being like, I love showing that, like passing that on, like, Oh, I did this. Um, are the ones that when they send them to me, I'm like, Oh God. And you're a little sick to your stomach and you, procrastinate doing it because it's a lot of work and it's hard yeah. and those end up always being the best ones um but you know when you first get it you're like fuck <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so um yeah honestly those are the best ones like doing new networks those are the best and just things that like you're like I love doing the ESPYs every year I love the ESPYs. ESPYs are one of my yeah. favorite live shows. I love hearing and, you on those. I love the ESPYs, ESPYs are awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, part of it is you want to work on the stuff that you're a fan of, or, or you know, you want to be involved with the things that make you excited. So those are the kind of things like 
I, I love sports, tons. I love all kinds of sports and being in a room full of sports rock stars is like, I'm a kid and I love that. So, and that was why like Kennedy center honors, those were, I think this year, um, I mean, George Clooney was get you know, there's George Clooney again, but he was get, getting the award. I remember looking it up when I was auditioning to see who was going to be, you know, getting awards this year. And they're just, they're so, the people are so inspirational that you're like, I would love to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, so that's a new goal then for me. Like, but those are the things like, yeah. and sometimes you just don't know they exist out there until they kind of come, come across your yeah. desk. And you're like, I want yeah. that. And well, you're like, since you touched on the sports, I know that you are a true Tom girl. And so I want oh. to know more about when you're not in the booth, what is it that, where are your passions? What do you love to do? If I could, if I had my choice, it would be surfing. I would be out surfing somewhere. And before the business got, before my career blew up crazy, great. Again, great. But I used to travel a lot more and surf. I had a group of friends and we would go around the world and go surf. And it was amazing. And I miss that, which is really, it's just hard to do. I mean, let's be honest. I also have kids now and a great career. So taking a vacation is incredibly difficult just in general. So, um, you know, trying to find that balance. That's my goal. Those are my new goals right now is trying to find that balance. But Um, my first would be surfing, um, personally. And I love, are you the one that, do you go, um, dirt biking? Yeah. uh, Not as much as Cammy. I went, we did a weekend together, so I'm, Mm. I'm I'm a newbie at it, but it was awesome. I would love to do that. I'm sure I would, my husband probably wouldn't let me. God knows I've broken tons of things on my body (laughs) because I'm like, I'll do it. I love, I just, I, I love doing the scary ones and sh- shaking it up. And I would love to do that. I'm sure my hu- my husband would have a heart attack if I even remotely thought about doing that. Well, yeah. Cammy and I'll have to kidnap you. We'll I, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go because that would be so fun. Oh, where we're back to the surfing. Where were some of your favorite surf spots? Costa Rica is my favorite. Is that, that was an easy one, Costa Rica. Mexico, always, there's su- a, such amazing surf in, Co- in Mexico. Costa Rica was my favorite trip. Had great surf too and great people. Oh, it was amazing being out in the water. All my friends that I surf with surf better than I do. Um, and I learned from them. And I, especially when we were doing a lot of the trips, I was still pretty new. But it was amazing just being out there with, people because they're so generous and yeah, I mean, cause it can get gnarly out in some places, you know, I, yeah. I'm more nervous about going out here in California at certain breaks because it's so, you know, yeah. everybody can get a little bit of the hard ass out there, but I do love it. Oh yeah. God. It's just the best. I mean, but I've done it like all the, we did snorkeling. We used to do, we did that for a while. I don't do that as much anymore. Um, that's, it's been years since I've done snorkeling. Um, but, oh my God, I went on a trip and went diving with great white sharks. Oh, nice. That was right before the kids were born. Um, and I remember that because it was five days of no phones, no nothing. So I couldn't do that now anyway, but, (laughs) and I'm terrified of sharks. I'm one of those that if I'm in the water surfing, um, if I get a feeling, I get out. I'm like, I, I'm like, no, there's, it, I just take it as like a little nudge of the universe. I'm like, I'm in their yard. And sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I'm not, hmm, maybe I should, I think I'm, a, and I've done that. I've done, like people are like, where are you going? I'm like, I, my session's done. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that I went on that and everybody on that trip, it was, I only knew one person. Um, it was just an opportunity that came up. So it was like, you know, 14 people. I knew one of them and they were all like avid divers. Like I'd done diving and I loved it, but I was not, you know, I wasn't avid about it. And I certainly wasn't, had no, if you'd asked me, do you want to go? I'm like, why would anybody get in the water with sharks? Hell no. But it was one of those that came up and it was like such a great opportunity. And I was like, I'll go. I was terrified. I was terrified. 
terrified. But I got in that damn cage. I even got in the <laughs> dangler one, the one that goes like 30 feet below. Wow. And it's just you and the dive instructor guy. And, you know, we popped out and there were like five great whites circling. And it was the most, I don't even know how to, how to even describe it. It was so surreal. Mm. I mean, the size of a school bus going past you. Your heart just like, in your throat. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But when you're in there, like, I think I've also realized that like, I've, ter- I've terrified of heights too, but I've jumped out of airplanes. Mm-hmm. I like to kind of go at the things that make me scared. Um, and I think when you do the really, really scary ones, you get to a certain point where you've passed your threshold for fear. So there's a weird calmness yeah. that comes because it's beyond anything you you're you're beyond being scared that's happened when I jumped out of airplanes I'm like because I'm terrified of heights I'm like what am I doing and you get so you're like all of a sudden I remember the guy going are you nervous and I'm like nope because I was past I was just (laughs) past that threshold oh I love how you just face that head on though like oh doing those things great love it yeah I think the only one of those crazy things that I haven't done is bungee jumping Mm-hmm. which <clears throat> I had gone to do and then it got canceled or something. And then, you know, you get older. Yeah. And then, you know, the bungee jumping went away after you're like, it just looks so jarring to your body. I was like, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe not that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I love that. <laughs> I love your spirit. I love your, you know, adventure. And I just love your, your whole attitude and you. So I appreciate you taking the time so much today. It's to awesome. Talk to me. Yeah. I could, I could keep you here for another hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Clearly I can just talk and talk. I don't have a problem talking. <laughs> just babble away. Awesome. Well, before I let you go, any last words of advice or any closing thoughts for maybe people wanting to follow in your footsteps and pursue a VO career? Just, you got to want to do it. Like this is not, it's not one of those fame jobs. It's you got to do this because you love doing it. Yeah. I mean, really. Beautiful. Where can everybody follow you at? Oh, let's see. Goodness. VirginiaHamilton.net. I'm a .net person because there's a famous author named Virginia Hamilton who has fantastic books. Children's and, books. Was it children's books? Children's yeah, books. I discovered that when I was doing research in you. Know, I know. Exactly. I was like, wait, that's not Virginia. I know. And it's so funny because it's not a very common name. Um, yeah. And I was like, oh my. And yeah, from the beginning, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm I'm not going to be dot .com or I'm dot .net. <laughs> so that's me, dot .net. And then do you have an Instagram? Oh, yeah. How, like, see, don't even think about that. Virginia Hamilton Jaco added the husband's last name there. Nice. Well, I should have met him when I was younger because he calls me Ginny Jago and I love that name and I would have used that <clears throat> for work. But that is a very cool name. I was already established. By the time <laughs> I met him, so there's no changing my name. You're keeping it. Awesome. Keep it. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to listen to you again in the Oscar season coming up. I'll be watching the show. No, it's exciting. <laughs> coming back in. Yeah, back in. Award season is around the corner. Yeah. Do you just love award season then? You I do. For it? Yeah. <clears throat> There's too many. There are too many now, but I do love it. Yeah. I do love it. I know. And then like now, now I was like, I got a bunch of movies I got to watch. I'm behind this year. All of a sudden it's creeped up on me. I'm like, oh, got to catch up. Yeah. But well, anyway, thank you so very much. You know, I love you. I really appreciate you taking the time to do with this you. Today. So everybody, check her out. If you were, if you're interested in VO, you definitely study what this woman does. She's just a, like I said, a rock star in our in our world. So thank you for all the insights and the tips that you shared with all of us today. Love you. <laughs> and that's it for today's episode. You can follow us everywhere at Tom Girl TV. You can go to the YouTube YouTube channel and catch all the episodes that maybe you've missed over the years. So excited to start the new year and have new shows coming at you all year long. And I couldn't think of a better way to kick this one off than with Virginia. So thanks for being our first guest in 2023. Thanks for having me. Right, bye guys. Tom Girl.